Man, I love it this morning. There's something happening here. We're just, uh, there's a buzz and uh, the place is full, so it's really exciting to be here with you this morning. Um, very welcome to anyone who is visiting here for the very first time. Is there someone uh, who's at the Rock Church for the very first time? If you can raise your hands. Hey, listen, let's just give them a warm round of applause. Come on, let's just welcome them, man. Uh, you are very welcome here. Uh, we hope that you will enjoy your, your time with us here this morning. Uh, for those of you then that don't know me, my name is Rudy Botha. I am, as Glenn had mentioned, currently under the role of uh, associate pastor, still but in the area of evangelism and discipleship. So a whole new role for me, and I'm very thankful for this church. I'm very thankful for uh, just the love and grace that uh, people here have shown John and myself and our family, uh, we've been here in Squamish for, it's five years now, uh, since we moved here from a small town up in the interior called Williams Lake. We were there for seven years and before that, South Africa. Uh, but it is here in Squamish that we find ourselves and where we sense God has us, at least for now. And, uh, and we're always, of course, open to hearing from the Lord what he has for us, uh, whether it be here in Squamish and whether it be somewhere else to share the gospel and to do the work of ministry. So, hey, listen, we are uh, in a series uh, teaching and preaching through the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young man with the name Timothy. And uh, we have been in this series now for six weeks. Can you believe it? In my mind, I was like, eh, is it three weeks? Feels like this is week four. Now, it's already been six weeks that we've worked through chapters one, two, and three. We are now in chapter four today. So I'm already going to ask you to turn in your Bibles. If you have your Bible open, um, go to First Timothy chapter four. If you have uh, your booklets with you, the study guides, you'll know where we're at. And maybe uh, in your Bible app too, to turn there. I'm going to read to us um, from verses 1 to 5. We're going to jump into reading it, and then we're going to dive into what I feel and sense God has for us uh, through these verses. Um, and I really sense that in this week, the Lord wanted me to also just backtrack a little bit to give you a bit of historical context of uh, what the situation was in Ephesus, that city where... Timothy, now when uh, Paul is writing to him this uh, letter, uh, Timothy is currently that young man that is charged with being the elder, the, the chief shepherd there, under Jesus Christ being the overall shepherd. So to help us understand the heart of Paul and the heart of, of God. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. I have it on screen for you. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences have been seared, who forbid marriage. And require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Let us just pray before we get started. Father, we just thank you again for your mercy and your grace. We thank you that we can approach you uh, with boldness as a result of your kindness towards us through Jesus, having died for our sins and enabling us to be called your children by believing in what he had done for us on the cross. So out of that place... We approach you with boldness, but also with fear and trembling, because you're a holy God, you're a righteous God, and you're a just God. 
We just come and ask, Lord, come and speak. Lord, uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in your sight, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wanted to start off this morning. It's going to be a bit of a lengthy introduction. Glenn knows I love doing lengthy introductions when we afterwards always recap sermons. And it's like, oh, that, that introduction, man, it was just a bit too long. Okay. This morning again, but I, I'm trusting that what God has asked me to do, yeah, <laughs> what, what He's asked me to do <laughs> is, is going to be helpful to us in really understanding. The heart behind this epistle, this letter. And not only the heart behind the letter and the man, uh, Paul, but listen, the heart behind the Rock Church's leadership. Us as a church. What is, what is our heart? What is it, what it, what's our deepest desire that we want to see happen within the lives of God's people? And I want to take us kind of like, on a flight, taking off uh, with that jet up 10,000 feet. I don't know how high we normally fly if we travel to South Africa. What is that, 10,000? Maybe 30,000 feet. I don't know if you're that high, but maybe 10,000 feet. But an overview again of leading up to this time where Timothy is in Ephesus. And this is the overall picture that I want to paint for us that you're going to see. You're going to see the heart of the Apostle Paul, who is a spiritual father... And he's writing this letter to a spiritual son in the faith. There's a very close relationship between the two of them. And it is as a result of their journey together throughout the regions of the outer parts of the world, as it was known at that stage. How they went on missionary trips together. How they preached the gospel together. Now, the book of Acts is written by the physician Luke, and it gives the history of the early church. If you want to know what happened in the early church, go read Acts. In the book of Acts in chapter 9, that is where we encounter Paul for the first time. He has got the name Saul at that stage. And who he is, is he is a a zealous, self-righteous Pharisee trained up in the law of the Lord. He trained under... Gamaliel, and he goes around, he's persecuting Christians. The, the people that came to faith in Jesus after Peter preaches the first uh, message at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls, 120 people are multiplied to 5,000. After that, the church is persecuted, and Saul is leading the charge. He's dragging Christians from their homes to be stoned. He is present when Stephen is stoned. That's who he is. He's a murderer. But he thinks he's doing God's work. And he has, in Acts 9, a radical encounter with Jesus because he chases after Christians who are scattered because of the persecutions. They are fleeing up north. If you can put the next slide up there, Alec. Let me get out of the way here. Uh, We have Jerusalem here. This is where the gospel is preached by Peter. The Holy Spirit falls. Saul is leading the charge, persecuting the Christians. The Christians flee up north. And on the way to Damascus, there's Damascus. Saul encounters Jesus. He falls off his horse. He's blinded. And then is led to Damascus where a man by the name of Ananias receives a vision from Jesus that he's going to have to pray for Saul so that Saul can see again because Saul has been set apart for a work of God. And it is here that we meet then the new guy. He's transformed by the gospel. Saul becomes Paul. And if you go and read Acts 9 to 11, you will read a little bit about the history then of how Paul then spends, and he mentions this in Galatians 2, Roughly about three years in that area of Damascus and Arabia where he learns straight from Jesus 
informed primarily through the Old Testament scriptures, but revelations from Jesus. And then he goes back to Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem. He's preaching. And then, of course, there's persecution again that breaks out because of Paul being so zealous. (laughs) He's overly zealous for the Lord. Can you be overly zealous for the Lord? Well, one would say, would be great if they just stone him and kill him there. Maybe he's going to be the first martyr. But no, the, uh, the disciples there ship him out. They send him back to where he's from, Tarsus. <laughs> they get him out of Jerusalem. And then if you read Acts, it says, the church for a period of time experienced peace. <laughs> because Paul wasn't there anymore. He's causing problems. He's in the street, preaching the gospel, and man, the church is suffering as a result of it. Okay? Really interesting. And now he's in Tarsus. And you read in Acts 13 then, what happens is, during this period of time, if you could throw that map on there again, Alec. These Christians that have now been scattered, they go all the way to the north. There are some of them that settle in Antioch. There are two Antiochs, so don't get confused. This this one here in Syria and there's another one here. Where is it now? Ah, there we go. It's in modern-day Turkey. So they go to Antioch, and that is where the church is birthed in Antioch. Without Paul, without any of the disciples there, scattered Christians. The early church spread the gospel as they were scattered. Let that just make you think a little bit about evangelism strategy. The evangelism strategy of the church has always been its people As we gather, we then scatter to share the gospel. But word of this comes round to Jerusalem. They hear about these Gentiles up here. Oh my goodness, they have received Jesus. They send Barnabas up. Barnabas checks it out. He's like, this is legit. He goes over to Tarsus. He finds Paul. He's most probably been still in contact with Paul. He knows Paul is... Like really just like, oh man, I just, I just need to preach the gospel. And he's stuck there in Tarsus. I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's visiting with old relatives, uh, drinking lattes. And he's like, man, what am I doing here in Tarsus? But then he is taken back to Antioch. And that is where we see in Acts 13, it talks about how they were praying and fasting. And they, they heard the Spirit say, set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work of ministry. Now listen to this. If you go and read Galatians again, Galatians chapter 2, Paul says that journey from conversion up until that point is roughly 14 years. Could be 14 to 17 years. It's 14 years. That's a long time. It's not just like that, that Paul is like, in ministry, preaching and teaching and going and being sent by the church. He starts off really fiery, but his passion is of such nature that it's causing problems perhaps in Jerusalem. They first send him away to Tarsus, and then he's back in Antioch. He's there with a bunch of leaders. They, they are apostles. They are prophets. They are teachers. They then set aside Barnabas and Paul for the work of ministry. And then, listen up. Very important. Acts 14. After they are set aside for the work of ministry, I like that uh, map again. He's now in Antioch. They sense we need to go on our first mission trip. This is where Paul and Barnabas, they travel. Sorry, first missionary trip. trip. They go to Cyprus. They go over this way, Perga. They move over here. This is southern or this is uh, Lycia. Southern Galatia, and then they go through these cities. Iconium, Lystra. Do you know where Timothy is born? Lystra. And this in Acts 14 is a fascinating encounter where Paul is preaching in Lystra. Listen what happens there. He sees a man that is lame. He sees this guy's got faith for healing. He heals that man. The people see him and Barnabas do these miracles. They think they're gods. They worship them like Zeus. They say, listen, this must be the gods that have come down. They bring animals. They bring fruit. They do whatever they do in the worship. They sacrifice. They're like, we need to worship these men. Paul and Barnabas say, no, we're not gods. 
But we are here representing the God who has created everything. The one that you see that had created the heavens, the stars, the everything. He is the one through Jesus Christ. They preach the gospel. And what happens? There are jealous Jews. They stir up a mob. They stone Paul. They drag him out the city. They presume that he's dead. Looks like he's dead. The disciples there come around him. They pray. He's resurrected. Now, it doesn't say this in Acts 14 that Timothy was there seeing it. But if you read Acts 16 then to 18, we read in Acts 16 that there in Lystra, Paul, Paul returns after he had gone to Lystra the first time in Acts 14. He goes back to Antioch and then he goes back to Lystra. And there he meets Timothy's mother, Eunice, who is from Jewish descent. She's a Jew. Lewis, that is Timothy's grandmother, who's a Jew. They have now become Christians. They most probably became Christians the first time that Paul shared the gospel there. It could have been that Timothy, as a young boy, teenage boy maybe, saw Paul there, heard him preach in Lystra, saw him doing miracles, saw him being stoned, heard about his resurrection. And then when Paul comes back in Acts 16, he sees that young man. He says, hey, you. You're a lover of God. You're a lover of Jesus Christ. You know the gospel. You have been raised in the scriptures. Come with me. And that's where the journey of the two begin. Paul takes Timothy. Map again there, Alec. On various missionary journeys. They then go from Antioch all the way counterclockwise. They go back as Paul, sorry, as Paul is traveling through Lystra. He gets Timothy. They go all the way here to the north, Troas. They hop over. They go to Berea, Thessalonica, Corinth. And what is interesting in this journey is it's there in Corinth that Paul meets a godly couple by the names of Aquila and Priscilla. They have fled from Italy. They have been persecuted because they are Jews. They believe the message of the gospel. What does Paul do? He doesn't tell them to stay in Corinth. He takes them with him. Map again there, Alec. Here we go. (laughs) Welcome to my... This is how I teach. uh, used to teach when I was in high school, a teacher. Okay. He takes... Thank you, Alec. He takes uh, Aquila and Priscilla, Timothy and these people that are with him, traveling with him. They hop over. They go to (whistles) Ephesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. But here they are in Ephesus, and what is now fascinating, Acts 19, you can go and read it, I'll summarize it for you. Paul comes there, or if if you read when he takes Priscilla and Aquila, he goes to Ephesus, he preaches in the synagogues, it doesn't mention for how long, but he takes them there, he leaves them there, and then he he goes back to Corinth and to other areas. He basically leaves Priscilla and Aquila to do the work of ministry there. When he returns in Acts 19, he finds believers. Because Priscilla and Aquila, together with a guy named Apollos, have been preaching the gospel. But listen to this very carefully, church. If you read Acts 19, it's fascinating. Priscilla and Aquila, they meet Apollos. They hear him preach and teach. He's a great preacher. He's very eloquent. He knows the gospel, but there's, a, there's something missing. They pick up, he is teaching the wrong baptism. He's teaching the baptism of John the Baptist, which was a baptism of repentance for the Messiah that was going to come. They take him home, they instruct him in the correct doctrine of Jesus Christ that baptism is an act of obedience. Towards your faith that you have placed in Jesus Christ. And then as a sign of you dying with Christ. And then being raised with Christ. You are baptized. Isn't that fascinating? Something to think about for you who have not been baptized. Because if you read Acts 19. What is even more perplexing. And I know. We, in our community group we were talking about it this week. We were talking about what is prescriptive and descriptive text. Acts is pretty much narrative, it's descriptive. But if you read the description there, Paul comes, he meets these disciples. They have faith in Jesus. He asks them a certain question. 
if you've met Christians across the world or somewhere else, we normally jump to the following questions. We're like, hey, what denomination are you from? Are you a Calvinist? Are you an Arminian? Do you, pre- do you speak in tongues? Are you a cessationist? <laughs> That's what we ask. Listen to what Paul asks them in Acts 19. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What a weird question. They say, no, we don't even know this Holy Spirit. What does he ask them then? In what baptism were you then baptized? They say the baptism of John the Baptist. He explains to them wrong baptism. He baptizes them. He lays hands on them. And I love this as a Pentecostal. It says, they came from the water. What did they do? They spoke in other languages and prophesied. No interpretation there. Go read it. Read the scripture as it says. No interpretation there. I'm just saying that. I hold that open hand. Oh boy, I'm enjoying this now. Okay. Listen carefully what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen to you or should happen. I'm just stating what is put there. I'm saying that to you because, listen, this is the crux of the matter. Fast forward then to Acts 20. Paul spends three years in Ephesus correcting theology, preaching and teaching sound, pure doctrine in a church where it wasn't as if there were just outrightly false doctrines, but there were subtle things that were not in line with scriptures. And it had an impact on the health of the church. Were the people not saved? Necessarily, no, you couldn't say that. But it had an impact on the health of the church. And in Acts 20, Alec, if you could throw on the next one. This is laying the foundation for today's message. In Acts 20, we have heard this many times. And you have heard of this here at The Rock. And I know, I'm, I snuck in, born in 1983. Supposedly, apparently, allegedly, I'm a millennial. I understand millennial mentality. I grew up as a millennial. I have taught in high schools. I have instructed Generation Z and Alpha. I know our generation, we struggle to get instruction and warning. And when leaders tell us, watch out, be careful what you read, be careful what you watch. Because there's something within us in our generation. We know it all. We have been raised in this way that we can achieve it all. Just dream it. You can do it. You are the greatest. The answer is inside you. And then when we meet reality of life, it hits us hard, our generation. Previous generations were raised in this manner. They cut you down. They make you understand how low you actually are, how little you know, how little experience you are. Then they raise you up. They build you up together as a team because if you suffer together, you will thrive together. Our generation, no, we want to thrive on our own, individually, individually, but we struggle to suffer together. Paul's message to that church and to Timothy is in this line. He says, I know after my departure, fierce wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw you away, the disciple, um, disciples after them. Next one there, Alec. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish you, everyone, with tears. Rock Church, listen up. This was just the introduction. I'm sorry, it's really long. I felt like, really, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. My sermon title this morning is, We Need an Urgency for the Truth. I need an urgency for the truth. I don't have enough urgency to know the truth. Please, Alec, next one. Okay? Um, and I'm going to illustrate to us out of this passage, an urgency for the truth is needed because we have a sign for the times. The signs of the times are here. It started when Jesus ascended 2,000 years ago. The end times started. We're in it. Uh, we need urgency for truth because there's demonic doctrine and liars. And then we will get an urgency, more of an urgency of the truth by believing and knowing the truth. 
Okay, I hope you guys are ready. Welcome to the Rock Church, those who are visiting for the first time. <laughs> this, this, is your, this is your opportunity to leave now if you're not ready for this. Okay, first one, a sign of the times. It says there, verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. Paul starts in chapter 4 after he's now chapter 1. Started off telling Timothy, go to these false teachers. Tell them to stop teaching this nonsense. It's false. Get it out. Nip it in the bud. Don't tolerate it. Get it out. Okay? Chapter 2, he goes into who are the ones that are going to preach and teach. In chapter 3, he gives instructions for leadership. Who are the ones to be elders. What are the qualifications of elders? What are the qualifications of deacons? But chapter 4 is back on this theme again. And I can just feel and sense then this church maybe reading or Timothy reading this. And he's like, oh, Paul. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, Paul. Paul, why? Why do you go back to this again? Well, the Spirit expressly says, Is he talking about the Spirit giving him a revelation there as he ex- experienced it in the book of Acts and, and various occasions that he would sense the Spirit is telling him, don't go to that city, don't go there, watch out here, keep on preaching the message here in Corinth. There are many here that are mine. Could be, but commentators write that is most probably as a result of just the mere fact that the living Word of God, Jesus Christ, empowered by the Spirit of God, preached it and says it and still says it today. It's present tense and it's continuing. The Spirit says there will be a deportation of the faith. And when it says that, it's not just a deportation of, okay, I don't love Jesus anymore. It's a total deportation of what is regarded as the orthodox view and belief and understanding of the faith of Christianity. Matthew 24, verses 6 to 11, Jesus said this, this. Matthew 24 is, of course, apocalyptic. Jesus is talking about the signs of the end times before his return. He says, they will deliver you up to tribulation and uh, put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise, lead many astray. Jesus said it. Paul is reminding Timothy of this. This is reality. I don't know what your theology is in terms of the end of days or end of, of times. Whether you are premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial, no millennial, whatever it is. Whether you believe the Antichrist is going to come in this way, shape, or form, the triple sixes. I don't know what you've read. Listen to this. You don't have to be concerned about those things. We need to be aware of them. You don't have to fear it. You don't have to fear rumors of wars and of, 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 of things happening and, and natural disasters. But what we need to look out for and understand is apostasy, a turning and falling away from the faith, is a very clear sign of the closeness we are in this point in time to the return of Jesus, either on the clouds coming for his bride or... Hey, listen, we don't know how long we're going to live. You could die just this instant and meet Jesus. But what we need to understand is we are in the times of, it's like a playoff game. It's the last five minutes. It's getting close to the end. Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians. Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in your mind, mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion, if you look up this word in Greek, it means apostasy, the great falling away. Until that comes first, the man of lawlessness will be revealed first. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians in a context where people are preaching and teaching, oh, Jesus has already come, the resurrection has happened. You don't have to work anymore. You don't have to do things anymore. Don't stress about this. False teaching again. 
But he's just saying, listen, remember this. There are, there are many things that first need to happen. And Jesus expressly said the gospel first needs to be preached in all the world before he will come back. Do we know exactly when he's going to come back? No. But we see the signs. He encouraged us, be aware of the signs like a woman that is going in labor. There are contractions and they are shortening. They are coming closer and closer and closer before this is going to happen. Rock Church, do we understand that the way that we view this and that the way that we look at what's happening in our world will have an impact on whether or not we have an urgency for the truth of God? If you knew exactly this week, the time and day Jesus was going to come back, will that make a difference to your life? What will you change and why? That's a big question that I need to ask myself. It's true, George. And we trust that it will find us doing and being at work with what he has called us to do. But an urgency for the truth is needed. And secondly, what Paul says and what I believe why an urgency is needed is because there's demonic doctrine and liars. We really need to wake up in the church about this. Paul says this. This is what they do. This is why the apostasy is happening. Devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons. He's not necessarily talking here about watching the exorcist during Halloween and, right, you're freaking out because there are demons and and, and those kinds of things. That plays a role. We're going to touch on that, okay? He's talking about something specifically here. He says, through insincerity of liars whose consciences have been seared, the NIV calls them hypocritical liars. Who forbid marriage. These are the two characteristics of this teaching in this context. They forbid marriage and they require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You see, what was happening in that context is what was creeping into the church and have crept into the church and been in the church for 2,000 years is rooted in a doctrine or a teaching of asceticism that is teaching that, listen, if I just deprive myself of great things that, or things that supposedly seem great, but they're actually evil, they're material, because it viewed the material, it viewed the flesh and everything as evil. Asceticism was teaching, if you deprive yourself of these things, maybe you will climb the ladder up and attain your salvation. And so what crept into the Ephesian church was a teaching that, yeah, you're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the same thing as the Judaizers. But they are saying, listen, sex, evil. He's saying marriage there, but he's implying sex because marriage between a one man and a woman was created and instituted by God for a purpose. To, yes, have sex, the pleasure of sex, but to reproduce, to multiply. That's what we see in Genesis. So let's deprive ourselves from that which is good. Or actually, if in the truth of the matter is good, but we perceive it now, this is evil. And let's take certain foods and say like uh, all the good stuff, like shrimp and you know pork and maybe uh, some brisket that's smoked. No, don't eat that. Deprive yourself. Okay. If you do that, if you stay away from those things, God is going to love you more. That kind of teaching has been in the church, specifically Roman Catholic Church, monasticism, going depriving yourself from certain foods, celibacy for millennia. Extreme Pentecostals, of which I'm not one of them, have got an extreme view when it comes to the usage of alcohol in that way. They forbid it. But if they really go and study scripture, they will see wine was produced To be a blessing, not a curse. But watch out. Don't let it be a curse. But that's what was going on there. And you know what it is? It's the same voice, the same question through these teachings. These demonic and spiritual forces at work through false teachers, hypocrites, are asking the same questions as the one that was asked in Genesis 3. Did God actually say Did God really say it's good for man and woman to be together? 
and not to be separated? Did he really mean that? And subtly, that creeps in. Paul had to uh, convey the same message to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15, he says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of the light. So it is no surprise if servants, or his servants rather, also disguise as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. That's what was happening there. It was, in church history, we have seen it play out. In various cults, that plays out. I want to touch on the broader context just a little bit here that I feel can very much be appropriated for us here also. If you go read Acts 19, where it gives a description of what happened in the Ephesian church, there's something very interesting for me that happened there that I feel like I want to apply also from this verse. It says in Acts 19, verses 18 to 19, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices after they heard Paul preach. A number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. There was very much a culture of sorcery. Do you understand that we are living in a time where sorcery and witchcraft and Wicca, occultic practices, are the norm? It's on TV. It slips in through advertisements. Just little things, little ways in which we are enticed to move in a direction of the unseen realm, but not based in the truth of God's word. Rock Church, may I encourage you that in both of these instances, whether it be that we are being confronted with preachings and teachings and ideas that are rooted in asceticism that I feel like, okay, I I need to let go and deprive myself. Maybe God's going to love me more. Whether it is that or whether it's outright the occult, I want to implore you, get out, run away, burn the books. You're not going to like it when you hear it. I'm sorry, but an urgency for the truth calls for a response like that in the Ephesian church. Those people were cut to the heart. They didn't think twice about it. They were convicted by the Holy Spirit. This is not of God. It's not bringing me to seek the truth of the Lord. In conclusion... What is the answer? What is the answer? How do I cultivate this urgency for the Spirit? How do I really press into the Lord? Well, believe and know the truth. Believe and know the truth. Paul says in verses 4 to 5, These guys, these teachers, they forbid marriage, require abstinence from foods, etc., etc. But these things have been created by God, to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You can receive these things, enjoy all things, because God has declared it as being good for you. Marriage is good for you. Sex is good. There are perimeters in in which it needs to happen. All food by Jesus Christ declared good. Eat it. Enjoy it. Unless it makes a brother stumble or listen to your conscience. If you feel like it's wrong to eat or drink something, do it. But don't judge others. If they choose to do it, but know the truth, listen to your conscience. And this is important. Why is this important? And how do we see this play out in the life of Timothy? Paul encourages Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 to 17, this is important to know and love the truth. Because he says, listen, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says again, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The whole counsel of God. This is my Bible. It's falling apart. I've got, uh, what is this? 
duct tape. My goodness, I have to duct tape it, okay? I'm not, I'm not doing this. This is as a result of I've got two little kids. It, hands, it lands in the wrong hands, and things happen, okay? But listen, <laughs> this collection of books, 66 books, have stood the test of time for millennia, thousands of years. It is the most hated book, the most loved book, the book that has been burnt the most, it's been banned the most, but it's still the top seller of all time. It's called the Word of God. It is inspired by God. It is good for you. It is healthy, and you need it. We need to have an urgency for this truth. If we are not in God's Word, and we're dabbling with things that are asking that question, did God really say We have to listen to the Holy Spirit. What is he saying about what I am dabbling with? Jesus said this in Mark 12, verse 24. Is it not the reason he's speaking to the Pharisees? They come and want to trick him about marriage and questions about the resurrection. He says, listen, are you not wrong? You are wrong. My generation, we hate hearing that. You are wrong. No, no, I'm not wrong. I've read it on the internet. I I, I know That is how I am. If I hear something, oh no, this can't be true. I'm going to Google this. Okay. (laughs) No. The Pharisees thought they were in the right. You are wrong. You neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. In John 8, Jesus promises this. He says to those who believed in him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Hear my heart this morning. You might be thinking, Rudy, you're just a a little bit overzealous this morning, man. Well, it's about time that I start getting a little bit overzealous. (laughs) I've been contained here in Canada. I'm from South Africa. We are are zealous for the Lord there. But I need to share with you something here in conclusion. Just a, a personal illustration and testimony. I was raised in a Christian home. My mother was a strict Pentecostal believer. She raised me in the truth of God's word. My dad was a believer, struggled with alcoholism, was a bipolar, uh, had bipolar depression. My mother, together with her faith, was a schizophrenic. But by God's grace, he kept me. He allowed me that by the age of four or five, I was able to put my faith in Jesus and keep me, lead me, even though I was a prodigal up to the age of 23, I had an encounter with Jesus. My life was never the same again. I moved to London, England in 2006, joined a church there. I was in a house with a bunch of South Africans, Christians. I shared a room with a guy who was a Christian. And you know what? During 2006, a book came out by Richard Dawkins, the atheist, called The God Delusion. My roommate bought two copies. He gave me a copy. He said, listen, Rudy, I really think we need to read this book. I've heard heard these things. I want to know what those guys are saying. You know what? I, I had that book in my drawer. I took it out. I started reading the introduction. And my conscience... And I look back at it, the Holy Spirit warned me and said, maybe not now. Maybe not now. 17 years after that, I look back. You know what? At that point, I was a Christian. I was born again, not baptized yet, not full of the Holy Spirit yet. I had not even at that point read one of the Gospels fully. Not one. Fast forward to 2015, here in Canada, after I come from South Africa, on a journey of where I came from a very influential disciples-making church, thinking, hey man, yes, I'm, I'm so overzealous, I'm just going to evangelize Canada. End up in a place, Williams Lake, man, dry bones. <laughs> I I landed there like Paul. I'm like, have you received the Holy Spirit? (laughs) Okay. But you know what? I came there with such an arrogance. 
Jesus put me and my wife in the church that we needed. It was not a tongue-speaking church. It was not the church that I grew up in. It was not the church that I saw the leadership representing what I felt like it needed to be represented. But Jesus had me in the church where I had to grow in humility, in stature, actually develop an urgency for the truth. Have you been in the desert before, man? Have you been in the wilderness where it's so dry? And you are, you are aching for living water. Have you been there? Have you been in the place where you're on your knees? You're dying, you're crying out to God because your wife couldn't have a child and you're trying for four years and you're doing everything that you can. But you have faith that God is going to make a way. Have you been there? And have you held on to the truth of God's word, his promises? I have been there. I've been through it now in the last year. And I'm telling you, Rock Church, God is wanting to do an amazing work in us as a church if we will submit to him, if we will trust him, and if we will just get this overwhelming picture again of the heart of God through the Apostle Paul to Timothy, through the leadership of the Rock Church. God's heart is for us as a church to be healthy, rooted in his word, built up in love, and it's as a result of God's love that it's been poured out for us through Jesus Christ. If you are sitting here and you have not experienced that before, if you have not had a radical, radical encounter with Jesus, listen, today is your opportunity as we move into communion. This is your opportunity to do business with God and to partake in what God has ordained for His church. If you are a Christian, this is the time that we need to really press in. We are in the dying minutes, I'm telling you, before we see Jesus Christ. I'm not a prophet telling you it's going to happen tomorrow, this week. The signs are just there. And now... It calls for perseverance of the saints. It calls for us as the church to actually stand up. And you will read in the book of Acts, be purified through deeds of righteousness. Actually live out the truth in love to a world that is dying and crying out for truth. So will you pray with me this morning? And I trust that the Holy Spirit will speak and do his job this morning. Oh, Father, we just thank you. We just thank you again. You are so good. We thank you for your truth. Jesus, you prayed, you said, sanctify them by your truth, for your word is truth. Oh, Lord, come and, come and lead us in your truth and forgive us for how easily we stray, how easily we reject, how easily we settle for less. Help us this morning. Help me, all of us, Lord, to trust in you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.